Thank you very much for coming for today. Uh, evening, we are hosting a very distinguished guest, Professor Matthias Bock, who is the director of Saxonian Institute for Cultural Infrastructure and a renowned scholar in the field of cultural policy. He is the author of more than 400 books and articles uh, written, edited uh, in these and related fields. Um, Professor Fock studied in Munich, Aix en Provence, and Berlin. Um, and um, actually, he received his PhD in Berlin, and uh, his career is a very remarkable one because it is theory with practice. It is, uh, he has uh, experience not only academic career, but also has been able to apply his academic knowledge to very practical fields, very pragmatically, I would say, because he is the author of the um, Saxonian Long Cultural Regions. He has been working for the state administration, but also, which is kind of has a uh, different flair, of course, for the pirate opera which is very remarkable as well. And he has been writing cultural commentary for the leading European newspapers. Uh, Professor Fogg has undertaken extensive research into the cultural basis of transformation process in Europe. And uh, he takes great interest in strengthening democracy beyond the European uh, big cities, metropolitan cities beyond the um, European Centre, so to say. And uh, this is one of the reasons why his research is of utmost interest in our country. And interestingly enough, he has done a research on uh, Caucasus as well, uh, having visited Georgia several times. So uh, already his, the title of today's um, presentation, ought we to tackle research on interculturality in an interdisciplinary approach, shows the depth of his uh, approach, and I'm sure that his depth, this depth will be uh, presented with the usual um, elegance, which is characteristic uh, to a professor Fogg, so it's with great pleasure thank you for to you. Actually, Georgia is one of the richest countries which I have the pleasure to know, rich in hospitality. This warm welcome, your coming shows this riches and news. Please accept my sincere thanks. You have invited me to speak on ought we to tackle research on interculturality in an interdisciplinary approach. There are three simple questions which arise immediately from this topic. What are researchers like? What is culture like? What means inter? Having found answers to these questions, we might follow the advice of Leipzig, the rector just mentioned, and we should combine that theory never without praxis. So let us start with who is we? The researchers or future researchers here in the hall. There are now rare cases of human beings artificially produced from three parents in Ukraine, which is highly problematic from an ethical point of view. When we here resembled at Ilya State University, we all derive from two parents which gave us their genetical material. There is an effect. Each of us has a sort of a twin insight. Maybe you have or had black hair because the respective allele here on the chromosome is dominant. And there is an unborn and unvisible twin inside us. It could have blonde or red hair and might even bequeath this to the children. This is not a purely virtual twin. He or she is real, though not materialized. 
Dear students, when you have tonight, look into the mirror and on your body. Maybe you should have a consultation with Lord Voldemort on this invisible twin. Real but not materialized. Dear colleagues, you might have a look into the slamming story of Camiso. What happens when you sell your shadow? How is society reaction when suddenly there is no shadow behind you? So, to, to return to genetics, allelomorphically we are diploid. Here is our phenotype, what you can see, and there is a non phenotype, the non visible, the hidden twin. Pablo Neruda once wrote, I quote, of the many men whom I am, whom we are, I cannot settle on a single one. Our chemical hereditary system is nothing special. We have it in common with other mammals. It consists of D and A. You have all on that at school. Yeah, this is deoxyribonucleic acid. It's thread-like molecules in Russian Volokhinsky and of some cell structures. The Austrian Swiss biochemist Gottfried Schatz said about the chemical hereditary system, it determines what we can be, not what we are, but what we can be. Transmission errors in the chemical system, so-called mutations, change our body. But is our eye, or our double eye, twin eye, really a singular? And this is the main point of today's lecture. What about singular? The human body only can survive because of a special kind of reciprocal hospitality. The genetic material which we receive from our parents, it coexists with microorganisms such as bacteria in the intestine. About a trillion creatures per millimeter. It's some two kilograms of bacteria in each of us. Two kilogram, this is more than even professors have brain. So what looks from the outside, from the phenotype, to be a homo sapiens, actually is a composite organism. And please remind this word for later, a composite organism. Here in the Caucasus region, you find many lichen, so in Russian, lichenik, Taxonomically, taxonomically, it's neither a mushroom nor an alga, but it is a mixture of both. It combines prokaryota, in this case algae or cyanobacteria, capable for photosynthesis, living in symbiosis with eukaryota, in this case filaments of multiple fungi, just alike. A human being combines prokaryota and eukaryota. Our eye is not a singular, our eye is multifold. When you have tonight another look into the mirror on your body, please remember that you have two quadrillions, quadrillion is the 15th power of 10, yes? That you have two quadrillions of bacteria inside you, and only thanks to these two quadrillions you can convert or metabolize food to energy, and you can live. And so <coughs> Bacteria have written history. You even might say they are at the roots of our republican system in Europe. On the eve of 20th September 1792, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe noted at Volney, from here and today, a new epoch of world history starts. And you can say you were there. The Austrian Prussian troops marched through the Champagne on their way to Paris at Valmy, so it's halfway from Luxembourg, Rennes here to Paris. They met <coughs> the French army, mostly volunteers without any military training. But alas, the Austro Prussian soldiers were not victual. They had nothing to eat for many days. The only thing they found 
were unmatured green wine grapes, which you know from Cachetia, I presume, too. And you know one should not eat this. So they became victims of Stigelosis, Russian Jitki stool, the intratestinal symbiosis of prokaryota and eukaryota collapsed. These soldiers were unable to climb up this modest hill. The battlefield was full, not with their blood, but with their excrements. The Braunschweig Duke ordered Richard in a sort of tie, and at Paris arrived notice that the French troops not had been vanquished. The next day, the French Republic was proclaimed. French history tells us about General Kellerman and his Vive la Nation. Correct would have been to erect a monument to the gram negative bacterium Shigella from the family Enterobacterium sick. So it was the symbiosis which didn't work anymore. The world history of symbiosis and of psychologist tortured competence, enabling the triumph of La Grande Nation, brings us back to Godfrey Jacks <coughs> and to a second term in today's topic, to culture. Jacks continues, the special thing about mankind is that we have two hereditary systems, the chemical one we just discussed and the cultural one. The cultural system consists of the intergenerational dialogue. So what the father tells his son, he determines what we actually become. The other was only what we can. This is now what we really become. Our chemical system does not raise us above other mammals, but our cultural system is unprecedented in nature. Its shaping power gives us language, art, science and moral responsibility. Some behavior scientists, such as Witten, tend to speak about cultures and chimpanzees too. But this only refers to intergenerational reproduction of tools production, which indeed is different between several groups of apes in the East African rift system. But what is tools? Human culture is by far more. When you have a look on the Musa here in Tbilisi, the lady in front of the Philharmonics, you will find that she represents some of the means of this intergenerational dialogue, which even allows a plurigenerational dialogue, not only from mother to daughter, from father to son, but on many generations. In her hand, Muta holds the symbols for Liba, Zonos, Imago, Ludus, book, sound, image, playing, Without these, you could not refer to culture in this country. It's bequeathed to you through many generations. But culture has always been open for changes. Chats continues, the accuracy with which these two inheritance systems carry knowledge from one generation to another is high, but not absolute. Transmission errors, so-called mutations in the cultural system, change our thinking and behavior. Cultural mutations change our thinking and behavior. Such a cultural mutation was the change from a royal to a republican system, or recently, here in Georgia, the change from a static communist party rule to a dynamic democratic system. The Latin word mutation in Greek language would be metabole, a word which you all know from the metabolic system, the metabolic processes in your body, and about which you all know that it must constantly keep going. Who does not eat and drink every day will not have energy rather faster. And <clears throat> we might reflect about the need of constant changes in order to constantly adopt to new group situations on the social level. And you might reflect on the difficulties to adopt the changes institutionally or individually. There are very old people in nowadays Eastern Germany who have seen and lived four system changes from the emperor to democracy, from democracy to Hitler, from Hitler to the Soviets, and now to democracy. This is four changes in one life. 
each of these systems with a different vision of the bird. Symbolized through with university institutions, which are per definition even less flexible than in the US. So a preliminary answer to the question who is who might be, we are links. Links in a chain, links in an intergenerational chain, which is a double one. Our DNA comes from our mother and our father, as their DNA plus mutations came from their ancestor, and as it will be given later to our children and grandchildren. Similarly, each of us is a link for language, for art, for science, and for moral responsibility in the long chain of mutations between our ancestors and our grandchildren. But even when we shallows are only links in a chair, and even when we are truly modest and call us dwarfs, big meats, in respect to the many generations afforded, it, as Bernard of Chartres says, we have a specific advantage. Isaac Newton put it this way, if I have seen further than others, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. At the core of many conflicts in this very world is the presumed singularity of the respective culture. At the core of many a conflict in this very world is the presumed singularity of the respective culture. National leaders feel themselves giants, giants standing on the shoulders of giants. So it needs to be seems to be necessary to now to ask, is culture, the word, the term, is it a singular? How could we otherwise talk about interculturality, which per definition seems to require a plurality of cultures, the one in dialogue or non-dialogue, with the other and with the third? Can we speak about interculturality without a plurality of cultures? What says linguistics? Grammatical number is a category that expresses count distinctions. When you learn a modern language, like English, French, German, and so on, most grammars will tell you that there are two grammatical numbers and basta, singularis and pluralis. In Europe, many languages have been, or even are, by far more differentiated. Look to the word politics. It stems from Greek language, which had, as all early Indo European languages, a one numbering, the singularis, a two numbering, the dualis, and a more than two numbering, the pluralis. The Greek word for more than two is poly. So, politics, which comes directly from this word poly, means you have to find agreements between more than two parties. So politics goes beyond the dualis. Therefore, differentiations is very, very useful. Semitic languages are by far richer than modern Western standards. According to Wilhelm von Humboldt, Arabic language has singularis for one item, dualis for two items. Then there is a limited uh, pluralis, the paukis, so-called paukalis, for three to nine items. Then you have a multitude pluralis for ten and more. <coughs> and when you are speaking about an unlimited number, there is even a plural, pluralis. Some Austronesian languages in the Pacific additionally have a three R. So one, two, three, and more. Linguistics up to recently thought there would be even a quaternal, so four people. Yeah? Many languages have a paralysis for items which you normally find paralyzed, like hands, twins, or pair of scissors. In old German books, you will find chapter one, the other chapter, third chapter. So to say it in Russian, it's not vtoroy. <coughs> So, but it's the other. In Russian and Polish language, you find important signs of dualis. In some Bavarian dialects, you will find the diploid word still in use. So, to say in short, there are more things in grammar and on earth, Horatio, than at Remtov 
in your philosophy and Shakespeare would have said. But what about words which gain a plurality not by declination, but which bear plurality inside them? What about non-count nouns, such as water in English, which would, which would be mayim in Hebrew? Both mean the same. Water is a singular tantum, having only a singular form, no plural. My name is a plural tantum, having only a plural form, not a singular. So, what about this? What about connective words, such as T? You may remember that while Shaw and Churchill likewise are blamed for saying England and America are two countries separated by the same language. In regard to the use of connectiva, this is correct. One of them says, the team are fighting among themselves. Which one is this? American or British? The team are fighting among themselves. Students, what do you think? British or American? British. Right. American speakers use the team is fighting amongst themselves. Therefore, British would say Georgia are winning the next Olympics? American would say, or not say, Georgia is winning the next Olympics, yes? So, I return to my question, what kind of word is cultural? Is it a normal singular, where a plural is possible? Is it a singular tantum, like water, where everything is included? Is it a collectivum, like tea? Is it a dualis, which, like a twin, needs a complementary? Term. The good thing about country is we know that is a very, very young word. This year it's only 2062 years older. It has nothing to do with these early Proto Europeans, peasant languages describing plants, animals, and flowers. We know precisely who it invented. It was Cicero in his Tusculane Disputationes writing on his villa at Tusculum. He dedicated this to Marcus Julius Brutus. You know, he's the one who killed Caesar the next year. And killing Caesar is very similar to French Revolution. We have learned a cultural metabole, yes. And this is what he said. All of you have learned Latin, I hope, yes? None would hardly know on this fruiferi sunt qui colontur. does it mean? He speaks first about the need of complementarity between the field and its cultivation. A field so fertile cannot yield a harvest without cultivation. The one, the field, is feeble without the other, without the cultivation. Then he speaks about new, you students. He needs, speaks about the need of complementarity between cognition and its cultivation. Sine doctrina animus fructuosus esse non potos. Without learning, the mind cannot yield a harvest. And then thirdly, he tells us, always here, that he is using an image, a metaphor, transferring this idea of cultivation from the earth field to the young person's head. So he treats us like a father. <coughs> Culture is basically a metaphor, not more and not less. It is a metaphor what you, dear students, are doing, learning, or what you should do, at least. Philosophy, which in this context basically means the ability to distinguish ideas in terms, as we do it today, is the cultivation, in Latin, cultura, of the soul. Learning with studio, which means seal, uh, staranje, draws out your vices by the roots, prepares to your mind to receive what your professors try to sow, and will make you able to deliver the most abundant fruit when achieving the academic goal. Dear students, the word culture has been invented by a frustrated professor. <laughs> My impression is he preferred mute cabbage to young and bright. Dear colleagues, a metaphor is a non-count word. You cannot
cannot count it by qubit, by hollow body, by light years. It's an image made of words. It's not a physical object. You may call the ability to recognize a metaphor as such the cultural alphabetization. It is, example of Grazia, the ground for the law system. It is such a cultural alphabetization for each complex society. For understanding whether culture is a singular or not, let us rush now very fast, five minutes, through the reception of this new wording, cultura. One and a half thousand years after Cicero, within the French language, Gruyère, Montaigne, Voltaire, Rousseau, they tied up to Cicero by using cultura, culture, without any attributes, just saying culture, and it means education. Within the, this was the French, within the English language area, then the 16th century we find composita like culture of the body, which means cultivating your body, making you beautiful, things like this, culture of the manners, being educated, and culture of the mind, giving half you to what you say. This is the English say, the culture of something, yeah? cultivation of something. Within the German language area, Samuel von Puffendorf takes culture as opposed to barbary and brutal nature. Perfectibility, yes, perfectibility in the ear of enlightenment means that the human being can flower out what he or she carries as a potential in him or her. Presupposed, he or she avoids the likewise inherent corruptibility. Culture, in this context, the German context of Buffendorf, means a sort of countdown till humanity comes to full display. So, 10, 9, 8, 7, and so on, yeah? Take it down, what hides the culture inside you. That's the perfect humanity inside you. Take everything away, and in the very end, 3, 2, 1, 0, you have the perfect humanity inside. This is the Baroque idea of perfectibility. And by the way, if you want to understand the difference between school and university, school gives things in you. University or good university, uh, it's charged with unveiling your inner potential. Well, the Spanish and Italian language area went with the French. The American with the British, the Russian and Scandinavian with the German. As to the term culture, we find a three partite Europe. But within all three language areas, culture is a, now the important thing, a singular title. Not a normal singular, but a singular title. Like water, because you have only one water without a plurality. This is was typical for the whole of Europe. Whichever language you use throughout the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th century, there cannot be another culture and not a third culture. Culture is one and best. Puffendorf's culture, as opposed to barbary and to brutal nature, gave legitimation of political power to. Imagine the sovereign's missionary task to free his subjects from natural barbary, to open their cultural potential. So, a king in the Baroque time, or a prince, he was something a missionary and, uh, uh, and a teacher. <coughs> this is very important to understand why the Germans or the Russian invested in the arts from Baroque time till socialism, whereas Anglophones are raised in a country where public subsidies for the arts have been forbidden since 1689. So you cannot compare. And when somebody is raised within the Anglophone countries, he will have a very different relation to art than somebody raised in Russian or uh, in the German influence sphere. So let's return to Valmy. In the eternal fight between the Gauls and the Zalmont, both sides used sometimes Kant, and they always used words. Kant and other Francophobian German writers distinguished between culture and civilization. A term coined 1757, so a few years before the revolution by Mirabeau, 
For the Germans, this civilization was an ape-like behavior, uncomparable to truly sophisticated German culture. Heinrich Heine would comment this approach in his Deutschland and Wintermeer in Germany, a winter's tale. I quote, the Russians and the French held the land. The British ruled the seas. But our, the Germans, but our sway is uncontested in the airy realm of the Venus. I say it for you in German. Franzosen und Russen gehört das Land, das Meer gehört den Briten. Wir aber besitzen im Luftreich des Traums die Herrschaft unbestritten. This is what Heinrich Heine says about the kingdom of the dreams. We need more Heinrich Heine as we can imagine. Please note one thing, returning to our point on the question of singular and plural, both civilization and culture were even at that time still used as a singular tante, not limited to one of these countries. The difference between these countries was which paradigma men priorized, whether civilization or culture. And ladies, and as well, I'm quite sure if German ladies would have been asked at Kant's time whether they preferred Kultur or civilization, they would have voted for civilization. So, when we speak about German Kultur, it's German method Kultur. In French and English languages, the two terms, culture and civilization, coincided. Edward Bernard Taylor would define 1871, I quote, culture or civilization taken in its broad ethnographic sense is that complex whole which includes knowledge, belief, art, morals, law, custom and any other capabilities and habits acquired by man as a member of society. You want me to repeat? Includes knowledge, belief, art, morals, law, custom and any other capabilities and habits acquired by man as a member of society so I would not know what is not inside this definition. It's everything. From such an ethnological approach, Russian Kulturologia should develop later, which has nothing to do with British pop art and its cultural standards. Culture or civilization, even for Taylor, 1871, is a singular tantum. But not everybody on our planet is partaking in culture. The Pacific people, at least. Florentine, the Renaissance, the more, maybe even Paris, the more, the city of London, the most, and Taylor is on the top. So Taylor sits in London, looks to the rest of the world, and distinguishes in grades of civilization. But it's still one civilization, as the idea. Many years later, 1934, when the British Empire had severely weakened and accepted parity with the US, Navy, and when it was slowly giving les adieux to a British-dominated globe, a certain Toynbee, in a study of history at London, used the pluralist form, not civilization, but civilizations. Germany would read Hochkultur. Toynbee <coughs> described the Babylonian civilization, and the Egyptian one, etc., all of the early societies, religiously hierarchical, urbanized, based on the division of labor. Again some years later, in his search for an enemy image, the Cold War had come to an end and the military industrial complex of both sides of the former Berlin Wall showed serious exhaustion. It had nothing to eat anymore, the military industry. It was close to Shigelotus, like at Valmy. Yeah. A certain Samuel Huntington relocated these early, very, very early societies to present-day societies. In 1993, he staged a class of civilization in foreign affairs. In 1996, he reenacted this in his book, The Clash of Civilization and the Remaking of World Order. That's this. That's the civilizational divides. Samuel Huntington from 1993. Now we have a war, you see very clearly, Islamic against Western. It's very interesting to see that uh, Western includes Israel, 
It's very interesting to see that Armenia is for Huntington is part of the Orthodox world, but well, looking there from Chicago, you cannot know everything, maybe. The problem is the Islam against what? Now there is invention. If you retranslate Western to a former word, using the Arab denomination of Morocco, Morocco, Morocco in Arab language means the most Western land country. This is the Arab name of Morocco. Arab is Western is Maghreb. So the most Western country actually is Morocco. But accident is what Europeans always use as word when they are Jewish or whatsoever towards the Middle East, which then is Orient and now we are Occident. So Occident is a phantasmagoria, a medieval term, always political for 1,000 years, it's now used by neo-nationalists through Europe. We will immediately turn up to this point because here is the political need of intercultural studies. After World War II, <coughs> between Toynbee and Huntington, <coughs> Americans found it easy to buy things in dollars. If you give a dollar, you don't need language. If you don't speak Chinese or Georgian and so on, if you want to sell things, it's very hard if you speak only American. So it was Americans who founded intercultural studies, wanting to sell more things. Exactly this what a certain American president now seems not to want. Thanks to Huntington, intercultural studies have left the mondial zone of selling and buying and become important in serious matters like war, terrorism and uh, the like. But when you search for cultures in the plural form, you will encounter a problem. Look, for example, to the cultures magazines. Cultures, in plural, it's magazine. It's edited by the American Society for Micro Microbiology. They work indeed with cultures, but with cultures of prokaryota, with cultures of bacteria. There is the no word. You will find a Cultures of Resistance <coughs> Network Foundation. I quote, it aims to promote and to support organizations, activists and artists to seek a more peaceful and more just and a more democratic world and which does not accept unsolicited grant requests. To each of these, this is within the British tradition of culture of whatsoever. You will find the Festival of Culture at Charlotte Will Community and so on. But you will hardly find cultures in the plural form in the same sense as in integral or cultural studies. To make it short, the latter take their name from culture, but they deal with differences or similarities between civilizations. They are called intercultural studies, but actually they deal with inter civilizational studies. This is it when you really look to the verdict. So, Rector Magnifici, dear colleagues, dear students, dear guests, it's time to come for a conclusion. But let's first have a pragmatic shift. Why are we discussing the questions interdisciplinary studies in interculturality? We are doing so because our world confronts migration. 2015 has been the year when the virtual community of migrants has conquered a virtual place of number 20 in the ranking of the world's biggest nation. If you take all the migrants of the world in 2015, it's ranked exactly between France and UK, place number 28. It's one of the big nations. And when you take only the unaccompanied minority refugees, even this is now bigger than a lot of nations in the world. The problem is, up to this very day, since 1648, politics is organized on the national scale and the talk of nation gives internationality. The underlying paradigm for nations is unity. I repeat, the underlying paradigm 
for nations is unity. So you see the, the singular, yes? One Georgia, and one Armenia, one Georgia, uh, one Germany, and so on. Since 1648, since the introduction of international law, unity was granted by the figure of an absolute monarch. With him, ethnic or linguistic or religious heterogeneity just didn't matter. After 1806, so with Napoleon and the fight against Napoleon, we see the rise of a new paradigma, national unity granted by ethnic, linguistic, religious homogeneity of a distinct people, which will fight for political autonomy by inventing a unique culture. So you have a Czech or a Bulgarian or a Georgian language schools in the course of the 19th century. You will have a Georgian National Museum, a Georgian National Theatre System, and stuff the like. The same you will find in Czech, in Bohemia, in Bulgaria, and so on. So culture is, singular, singular culture serves suddenly as a tool for fostering political autonomy or self-regulation. Here now you have this kind of not more singular tanto, but singularity, <coughs> singular culture. It is a double fighting against the Tsarist oppression and against other ethnic utterances on the territory. And these other ethnic utterances now in a new political mathematics are called minorities. And you want to understand the successful America first, Mexicans back to Mexico, you just look to the statistics. Caucasians will be a minority among other minorities in the 2040s, within the next 25 years or so in the United States. Hispanics, Asians, the black and the native Indian communities will count more citizens than the white, be it Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, agnostic, whatever. So, emigration, <coughs> immigration, Transmigration. As well as elitist and global companies' overcoming of local boundaries is a new reality. It's lethal for the internal concept of nation state and it's lethal for the multilateral concept of internationality. We see with Trump in the US and his American singularity, we see with Le Pen, which might win the next French presidencies and her uh, French singularity. We see in Germany with the AFD, we see in Austria, we see in Hungary, we see in Poland, we see in Turkey, that heterogeneity is inacceptable for populist nationalists and their followers. Everybody calls for a singularist for his or her singularity. So culture has become, now important, culture has become a singularist exclusivo. And it has, we have started with culture as a singular tanto, so just the opposite. Let's have a look on an example. The newest scandal in Turkish ideological battles concerns Ahmed Güneştekin's culture, Konstantin. It's installed, or it was installed, outside of the A plus shopping mall in the Ataköy district of Istanbul, very close to the airport. Kostantini is Ottoman Turkish. It was for four centuries the official name to Constantinopolis after the Ottoman took over in 1453. So this is the official name yeah, of Istanbul. Instead of the Greek ending polis, city, there was just the Arab ending Ilya, place, was used. Only much later, in 1928, the new Turkish government changed the official name back to a Greek one. Aistin Polin means it's Greek and it means into the town. So Istanbul is not at all a Turk naming, but an Armenian way of stammering Greek language dating back to the 10th century. Gunistikin's culture addresses the many names of the town since Byzantium. But immediately after installation, one day only, Imagine, one day only, the mob called for take it away, threatening to burn down the shopping mall and threatening 
the dependence of the people working there and the shopping mall too. So there was no way. Within 24 hours, it was, as you hear, sees, removed. It was December 24th, which is a very good state from a Western Christian perspective. 300 years before, a certain Daniel Defoe started his The True Born Englishman, 1971, with the phrase, Thus, from a mixture of all kinds began that heterogeneous thing an Englishman. This is the first line of Daniel Defoe of 1701. Please imagine the fate of a Turkish poet when writing to Erdogan. Thus, from a mixture of all kinds began that heterogeneous thing the Turkish man. Politically, he could do no more wrong than this. Genetically, as we have learned, he would be right. And culturally, this is up to you. And I would like to leave this question to the debate. I would like to conclude. First, intercultural studies take their name from culture, but they deal with differences and or similarities between civilizations. So it should be called inter-civilization. Each single civilization is presumed to have an inner unity called culture in the singularities. It meant to be a singular tanto without pluralis, but it's an exclusive one. When Wilhelm von Humboldt once spoke on the behalf of the dualis, you know, you remember dualis too, about a collective singular which brings back multifoldness to unity. This is a very nice program. A collective singular which brings back multifoldness to unity. It is most, thirdly, it's most important to see that such unity setting is a teolo teleological approach, typical for romantics. I quote again Humboldt, the origin and the end of all shared being is unity. So unity is really maniac for these romantics. In a way, today's nation states are victims of German romanticism. Fourth, as we have learned before, heterogeneity, multifariousness, the plurality of I and we, is one of the biological keys to human being and to its success. For quite many effects, Homo sapiens is a composite organism. <coughs> Fifth, from all what I have mentioned on history and literature, etc., you may have understood that culture is such a composite organism. Six. But when, in the Romantic period, the nation was idealized to have a body of itself, in German, you, you know it, Volkskörper is the name. The unity approach derived a homogeneity principle. Within such a teleological approach, heterogeneity does not combine with the sacralization of a nation. You do not believe in God, you believe and preach to a nation. When you do so, you cannot accept heterogeneity. And then everybody who thinks else, who behaves else, is becoming an enemy. This is the effect of secularization. Seventh, what is needed now is a political conception, which overcomes the unity paradigm and understood societies as a composite organism. Well, last question, what means inter? Non plus ultra was an antique saying of Heracles. Heracles could do everything, but the one thing he could not do, he could not go non plus ultra, not behind the columns of Gibraltar. He could not go into the Atlantic, because the th thinking was, you go 10 kilometers and then you fall down. Earth is finished, so non plus ultra. You cannot go beyond this. Later on, there was a new emperor, Charles V, he took away with his pair of scissors the non, and he said, plus ultra, I am going beyond. And this is still the seal <coughs> of nowadays Spanish Republic, plus ultra. And this is what we are doing as researchers every morning. Ten more.
if we would limit to what anybody else has written before us, yeah. it would not be worth researching. So researching is always ultra. So ultra disciplinary, leaving what has been thought is normality, so we have not to describe it. What about trans? Trans is when you go in Rome, on the other side of the Tevara, of the river, then you come to a part of the town which is called Trans Tevara. Trans means crossing. So <coughs> the Trans Siberian, does it link, let's say, Moscow and Novosibirsk? No. It goes through. It is linking, going through Trans, through Siberia, and it's going to link Moscow and Vladivostok. So Trans means you do not touch this. Transdisciplinary is something which is normally not possible, <coughs> but there are very nice examples. One is which you use every day. There have been philologists who wanted to know how many commata and how many times the word love and whatsoever is in the Shakespeare, so-called corpus, yes, in all these texts. Though they asked IT specialists to deliver uh, for them a extendable language markup to mark up all these commata and so on. And the IT people did so, but they delivered something else. It's called now XML, Extendable Markup Language. The internet came out from this research on Shakespeare. The texts asked for the IT specialist. This is transcultural, but this is something you cannot ask for. So trans <coughs> for us is not uh, possible. So there is one last thing <coughs> now, which I would like to mention because anybody of the students or the colleagues has already gone to America. You have to fill. So I wanted to go, apply for a visa, and then you have to cross which race are you. And what have you uttered, Temo? What is written there? I can't remind. No, but somebody. So not the nationality, but the race is asked. Caucasian. Okay. Caucasian. Anybody of you knows why you are called Caucasian, and I am Caucasian too, when going to the United States? For the race. No. Yeah, yeah. Who invented the term oh, Caucasian race? Uh, yeah. Very good. Bravo, bravo. <laughs> so, this is a very interesting man. So, he was a biologist, he was a medical doctor from Gotha, working in Göttingen, and he was very much in favor of black people. And he said, they have the same dignity as we have. So the Germans, the Europeans, the white one. There have been a lot of people already at this early, late 18th century and early 19th century who said, no, 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 the Europeans are something better. And he said, no. And then he was a phrenologist, so he was a specialist for bones, especially for skulls. skulls. And uh, so he made his research and he said, we have similarities. And so he was the one who made up this black and yellow and uh, uh, here, Caucasians, Mongolians, Ethiopian, Americans. In the very end, it was Malayan too. So you can see first edition 1775, this is even before the French Revolution. And uh, the interesting point for you is why he did so. He explains Caucasian variety, so he does not use the name race in the Latin thing. He speaks about varietates, varieties in the Latin thing. This is important to say. So he was a Variationist, something like that. He was not a rationalist. Yes. Caucasian variety. I've taken the name of this variety from Mount Caucasus, both because its neighborhood and especially its southern slopes produce the most beautiful race of men 
and in the judgment. Mm -hmm. And because all physiological reasons converge to this, that in this region, if anywhere, it seems we ought to, with the greatest probability, to place the autochthons, the origin members of mankind. So, Georgian ladies are the most beautiful ladies of the world, and therefore the white race is called Caucasians. <laughs> this is what Blumenbach says about you, 1775. 250 years later, we know the first is right still. The second, with mankind originates from the Caucasus, we now know it comes from the East African. <coughs> Uh, system, the rift system, but as soon as we, as mankind has left Africa, the Caucasus actually is the first. So it's not the first, but it's the second step, if you want. But this doesn't really matter. What now interests is something different. We have to compare the Blumenbach position with a controversy which is very important. I return now to genetics between Leventon, 1972, and Mitten, 77, and Edwards, 2003. Leventon marked 17 points within these genomes, which we have seen with the chromosome and so on. And he looks out and he says, 99.99% of genes are non-variant between human individuals. So the difference between you and me and everybody else on Earth is only 0.01%. The rest is identical. By the way, most of that is identical with apes and chimpanzees and uh, any other mammals too. But this is not. From the remaining 0.0% now, is 85.4% variations within a population. 83%, so 10, 10 times less, is variations between populations within one race, so within the Caucasians, within the Ethiopians, and so on. And there is only left 6.3% variations correspondent, corresponding to racial classification. This is 0.00063% of all possible genetic variations. So, when this evening you step outside here, Ilia University. Whomever you met, meet there. The chance to meet genetic diversity here when stepping outside Ilia University is 12 times higher than going with Ario Flot to Timbuktu or wherever. You understand? Normally you would say going to Timbuktu, they are very strange, they are completely different. No. Lamentin has analyzed and says the difference for you stepping out here with anybody else is 12 times higher than going to Timbuktu. Therefore, Lamentin says, he concludes, the races have, I quote, no genetic or taxonomic significance. Many later testings by other scientists approved it. Approved it. And this is why in 1998 the American Anthropological Association stated that racial classification would be meaningless. But a few years later, this was 72, now 77, Mitten, followed by Atbas 2003, with worldwide controversy, Mitten argued that while Levantine's statement of variability was correct, when examining the frequency of different alleles at an individual locus between individuals, it's nonetheless possible to classify individuals into different racial groups with an accuracy that approaches 100% when one takes into account the frequency of the alleles at several loci at the same time. There is a long thing, a kip. Most of the information that distinguishes populations is hidden in the correlation structure data. That's the important point. Not the data itself, but the correlation. So this is now, when you are going to Google, with all the analytics they have, it is the correlation which makes their profit. It's not the information itself. Yeah. So this is a new kind. So the correlation is here. So within one scientific discipline, we have a second scientific truth which stands parallel to the first scientific truth. 
both are right, both are proven. The first one, the Levantine one, corresponds to a certain political uh, position. You remember 1968. It was the peak of flower power. Flower power is normatively, not scientifically, but it's normatively based on the equalness of people and the equalness of peoples. We may call this a center-left mainstream, which is dominating, for example, with me in Germany since now 1970s, for 40 years. You have experienced this. This is the normative thing. All people are equal, and peoples are equal. Then we have another political position, the, the one with uh, Mitten and Edwards. It corresponds to George Orwell, George Orwell, who shortened it, you have all read it, all animals are equal, but, you can continue? Some are more equal. <laughs> some are all equal, if they are pigs. Yes, some are more equal. So, <coughs> this is the George Orwell way look on uh, Moscow at that time. So we have a non-normative position which accepts inequalities between people and between people's both. So let us now look, this is nowadays controversy, controversy, very important for politics, genetical difference or non-difference. And there is not one truth, but two truths. So we are alike, we cannot decide. And the specialists cannot decide either. So I say we now have a look back to Blumenbach. What does he do? So this is why beautiful Georgian ladies are the most beautiful. Yeah? I shall say it again. Now this is the Blumenbach region of the Caucasian. He includes all Europeans except Sami. He includes all Western Asians up to the River Obi, the Caspian Sea, and the Ganges. The Ganges. Yeah, have the Ganges. Yeah. Up to Bangladesh, from Ireland, Island, and so on, everything here. The River Obi would be here. I have made it a triangle, it might be a quadrangle, it doesn't matter. And finally, he includes, Blumenbach includes, the inhabitants of Northern Africa. So he makes a stretch from Bangladesh here down to Morocco somewhere. It's all for him Caucasians. So indeed, Tiflis now is in the middle of this cultural triangle. And now with this Blumenbach triangle, when we look back to Samuel Huntington and his clash of civilization, now Mr. Huntington has a problem. His clash becomes an internal, so to say, an intra-cultural affair between brothers, which basically converts in only five families of language, three of them here in the Caucasus. Then we have the Indo-European, which goes from here. It's all Indo-European, including Persian and so on, or Kurdish and so on, Slavic, Germanic, Romanic, and so on, till here. This is all one. Language of families. And the other one is Semitic. It's Hebrew, it's Arabic, it goes over there. And thanks to Malta, it's even a language of the European Union. All of these Blumenbach Caucasians believe historically in the same God. Normatively speaking and politically speaking, it might be good if all these people would know more about their relatedness. But this is normatively, it would be good. So it would be good, Mr. Rector, maybe someone in the world would dare to open up not intercultural studies, but intracultural studies. <laughs> what means all this in practice? This is not. Leibniz reminded us to combine theory and praxis. Ilya is proud not to forget the teaching component. Suppose Ilya State University would open up a PhD program in intercultural studies or even in intercultural studies, who knows? How should this program look like? I propose to you a slogan. You remember Gottfried Schatz? We might say without cultural competence, no intercultural competence. 
without cultural competence, no intercultural competence. Within the first year of such PhD studies, the following courses might be teached respectively. They might be followed at Tbilisi or at the party university abroad. The latter model would bring interculturality not only to the cognitive but also to the other dimensions of students. And we should simply remind four things. Candidates have to understand the individual and the society as composite organisms. Okay? Composite organisms, like the legion, yes? What I showed you. The one cannot live as the other. My uh, eukaryota cannot live without the prokaryota. We are a composite organism. And this is the true tool for society. Secondly, candidates have to understand the hidden twins in each of us. So, you remember the alleles, yeah? Brown hair, brown hair, brown hair, suddenly the other one comes out, not the dominant, but the recessive gene, yes? Do you remember that? These hidden twi twins in it. And this is true for society. It's a wonderful metaphor what happens in society. Suddenly you have an explosion which you did not go have, but it's inherited. But it was not dominant, it was recessive for a lot of time. This is what you have to understand, these hidden twins in each of us. The most important is this, candidates may need a critical conscience of singularity discourses. This is what I was now talking about. The singular, plural, dual, singular, tantum, singularity, and so on. And that it is, has been necessary at a certain time, if you have a Napoleon and so on in front of your doors, but now there is no Napoleon, now we have Le Pen and so on, these is. So we need this understanding of singularity and therefore you need a thorough knowledge. Otherwise you cannot break the singularity of discourses. So, what can we do? Let's say we are now composing a PhD course. A couple of disciplines we need. Parameters of identity in European cultural history. So you remember Valmy and all these identity things. Orient and Occident, a history of distrust and of similarities. Who has invented the Gothic cathedral? The Arabs. Who is inventing the cloister of Western, uh, of, uh, Western community? The Arabs. Who has invented the idea of uh, garden? The Arabs. And so on and so on. Nobody knows, but we are all using. That's the hidden twin in Occidental history. We need very important intercultural law. So what there is this international or transnational and so on law about the possibilities of reconciliation? What about the responsibility to protect? That's an intercultural law, for example. Sociology of migration includes the question, can somebody like Mr. Uh, I've forgotten the name of the American president, can he live without Mexican immigrants and so on? So this is all part of society of migration. We should speak about economic and cultural areas, Sub-Sahara Africa, Ibero-America, Middle East and North Africa and so on. What about intercultural psychology? It all comes out from selling. That's the basic. That has been invented. So this is when you read through it. You can learn it within one afternoon. The theory is really basic. But the problems behind are really substantial. So we need a, a new kind of intercultural psychology. We have to understand the role of the arts within transformation processes. Very, very important. Remember the Musa in front of the Tbilisi Philharmonics. How strong it was in the 19th century and so on and how strong it still can be. We need intercultural philosophy and aesthetics. We need intercultural encounters through the arts. And as you have been learning a little bit within the last hour, we need some strategies of intercultural 
cultural policies, policies for minorities, for immigration, for multiculturalism, for parallel societies, for citizenship, cultural diplomacy, and conflict resolution, and so on. So it's a very bright and close. Dear colleagues, from the School of Arts and Sciences, the School of Law, the Giuliani Business School, the School of Natural Sciences, I would be most interested to hear from you which aspects, which disciplines are missing here in this first draft for a truly interdisciplinary approach to the phenomena of interculturality and of intraculturality, according to you. And in which way the chairs of LIA and maybe of other universities may participate in such an approach. I would like to thank you for your hospitality and have this really long time. Thank you so much. Bye bye. My question would be about the uh, problem of universality. Um, do you see a place for this concept, for a very important concept, after defining the space of this inter? Is there something legitimate and authentic in so many efforts to, let's say, perhaps not so much erase the differences, but go beyond them. And we see these efforts starting with at least St. Paul and going uh, to the Enlightenment period. Now, not to confine oneself to the meeting between the cultures, but saying there is something beyond universal to be respected by each and every culture, which could be then the space within which this culture reads. So do you have in your own kind of systematic of thinking about culture the place for such a thing? Thank you very much for this indeed very fundamental question. My answer is that the United Nations just have asked the world to found such a thing. Because they are now speaking about the one word concept which means we are related. Whatever you do in the Amazonas is important for the Mississippi and for the Ganges and so on. So this is relatedness. And uh, the United Nations now in this new concept, which has been uh, uh, decided for in September 2015, this one world strategy says that we have not only on the economical but also on the social and on the cultural field a lot to learn. <clears throat> the problem with this United Nations approach is when you have 30 or 40 rich countries and uh, 150 non-rich countries, it's very clear that you will have a majority for such a one world approach. The music plays up to now within these other 30 countries. And when you are looking, for example, to the academic system in Germany, same would be true for France and so on. They are only dealing with problems which they think within their nation. So within German universities, we would have a very strong quarreling uh, between these two kinds of policies which I stated before. More, said before. More strong is the center left, based normatively on equality, <coughs> and then there are the others, which are the conservatives more, which says there are inequalities and we have to accept them on a simple statistical basis and uh, so on. Both are thinking within the national frames. Opening up and saying the world is more complex and we need us to think about the reflection for the moment is very difficult indeed. I see it especially now in November, December, January, we had a lot of discussions on the Berlin level and on the level of Severin, uh, of the lender. And this is why I would say the best place for such a thing 
is not basing it, let's say, in Germany or in Georgia, but on an international collaboration, so which widens automatically uh, all necessary and potential disciplinary approaches and so on. And this goes alongside with the United Nations strategy, and it goes not alongside with all these national quarrels which we have at the moment. I mean, you have heard about Hungary, for example, and all these new nationalism which are very strong there. So I would go into this direction. This answers your question. More questions? If not, I presume you want to read now. Okay, so. <laughs> So, uh, so uh, thank you once again very much, and um, to honor your contributions to the study of culture and in token of future cooperation, we are also planning. Well, the Academic Council of Indian State University is awarded an honorary, um, honorary doctorate, doctorate to Professor Fock, and so I'm now kind of giving you the insignia of this. Uh, so, to this first of all, the robe. Okay. Here we are. This is the uh, head. Oh, wow. And we take a picture with you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's hope these are signs indeed of good future collaboration.